So in my presentation, I'm going to talk about gender and intersectional perspective on robots and um, artificial intelligence, AI. And uh, this is a topic I think will be of interest to many of you. Uh, I see that you have quite diverse backgrounds. Some of you are researchers, some of you work in um, project development, but I hope that uh, this will be um, on a level that uh, will be uh, beneficial for your own uh, studies or interests. So uh, the two questions I'm going to discuss in my um, uh, presentation today is uh, number one, are robots and AI gendered? And number two, can they discriminate? And uh, I'm going to start with an article I wrote in 2017 when I was very curious about how we humans gender robots and how robot gender expression is being uh, both portrayed and how we receive it. And what I found in this article is that the more human-like a robot becomes, the more gendered it also becomes. So what is it in us humans that makes us have a, a sort of need to gender things? And uh, this article was actually a little side project I wrote um, on the side of my PhD, but it ended up being uh, quite popular, actually. Um, I just checked the journal and it is, um, right now the most read uh, article ever for this journal. So uh, it has clearly struck um, a nerve on, on something. And um, as Linda mentioned, it actually led me to the European Commission for Research where uh, Linda and Sabine and Matthias and I uh, worked in this uh, group on gender innovations too, uh, where my uh, role was particularly on um, robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, so to draw a little bit on um, what my focus area was in this article and also in my work, it is the anthropomorphization uh, of technology. So how we attribute human qualities to a non-human thing. Uh, you can, for example, think about uh, robot vacuum cleaners. Uh, if you have one, there's a high chance that you have given it a name or even a personality. Uh, you might um, uh, also see this in, um, in more advanced robots and even more so when it comes to some of the robots I'm going to show you um, in just a couple of seconds. Uh, they are often quite gendered and are given um, a sort of human personality. And you can also think about this in relation to your biological pets. For example, you often give them names and uh, of course they, they have a biological sex, but you also tend to give them gender characteristics based on societal structures. Uh, but how does gendering technology impact us as users and us as a society? Does it matter that technology is gendered and how does this matter? So uh, first I want to give you an example here of a robot I have studied uh, previously uh, when I was living and doing research in Japan. This is a Japanese robot called uh, Pepper. Uh, he's also found, and now you can see I said he, uh, without thinking about it, but he's found at uh, NTNU where I work, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and he's actually French in origin, and then he was bought uh, and then resold and redeveloped in Japan. Uh, and on the top, on the photo here on the top right, you can see Pepper without any um, clothing, uh, which is of course the, the norm, but uh, the developer and also um, buyers and consumers uh, across Japan mostly have also made different uh, uh, clothes for this robot. And he has even been in different fashion shows. And uh, um, if you know anything about Japan, it is, it is that they are quite uh, uh, crazy about robots. So you, we shouldn't be surprised that there are robot fashion shows there. Uh, but this line of um, fashion or clothes that you can see on the bottom right um, is quite gendered. Uh, you can see here a little uh, Red Riding Hood uh, costume, and then a butler costume, and then another uh, costume with um, with a blue or a purple dress here. And of course, they can't use uh, real hair, so they have to use hair that doesn't disrupt the sensors of the robots. Um, but I was quite curious why uh, fans and developers uh, alike tended to make clothes for the robots and to give it even more uh, gendered personality. And uh, after I've published my article uh, on Pepper, I've seen that they have actually changed the uh, website for the robot. 
So right now, this is what you can find when you go on the developer's website. Uh, here they say Pepper is a robot that has no gender. So they have this um, uh, quite uh, binary representation of uh, gender. And then they have a little checkbox with Pepper on the far right here. And uh, this really intrigues me because what they write uh, further on their website is uh, Pepper is neither male nor female, but as you get to know Pepper, don't be surprised if you find yourself referring to Pepper in a gender that makes the most sense to you. So they are putting the gendering up to um, the views of the beholder or the, um, the hands of the um, consumer, uh, which is quite interesting. So they have withdrawn the clothesline and now it's up to the consumer to uh, give Pepper a personality. Um, but I want us to consider for a moment, uh, does a robot really need to be male or female or neither male nor female? Uh, I want us to go a little bit beyond uh, this uh, binary understanding of gender. And I want us to consider a theoretical um, framework of cyborg theory that some of you might have been uh, um, reading before and for some it might be new. But uh, this is a quite uh, old concept. Um, from Donna Haraway in the 1980s. Uh, it's a quite uh, famous theory now about uh, the undistangible mergings uh, of different, um, uh, different things like the human machine merging, the nature culture merging, and society technology merging. And what we mean here by uh, this intangible is that you can't really distinguish between what is a human, what is a machine, what is nature, what is culture, because it's all becoming so mashed up together. So it's difficult to draw a straight line like this is what is part of the machine world and this is part of our human world. And uh, Donna Haraway's argument is that it's quite impossible to detach ourselves from the technological. So in her words, we are all becoming cyborgs. Uh, and of course, when we look at quite complex machines such as Pepper, you might think, oh, I'm not going to, to live with that robot or I'm not going to become a robot myself or anything like that. But I want us to think about more mundane technologies. So for example, your smartphone, which um, most of us have a quite uh, intimate relation with, we can't really work or uh, do many things without our phone and uh, let alone our PCs, uh, different GPS systems that track where we go and who we go with. Uh, you can just have an example now from the Corona app just to, to see um, are we moving about in society in a, in a safe manner. Um, this also, um, the merging with technology is also quite um, present when we think about remote work. For example, uh, right now we are meeting through technology, so we are not physically going to a meeting and I'm, I'm not uh, coming to you in a, in a non-technological way. You're actually able to hear me speak now because we are using technology and we are using it to work in quite novel ways. And uh, transportation is also a good example of this because we transport ourselves in technology. Uh, so Donna Haraway's argument, and uh, to some degree, I agree, we are becoming techno beings, um, humans living today, are not really able to detach themselves from technology uh, in a way that makes sense. So of course, this is a theoretical concept, but I think it's quite useful to take with us when we think about how much technology is impacting our lives today, and especially digital technology, which is uh, the topic of, um, of this presentation. Uh, I have another example here from Japan that I wanted to show to you. Uh, this is one of my favorite Japanese entertainers. Uh, this is um, in in their own words. This is uh, a male. Um, this is a person identifying as a male but portraying a female character for entertainment, um, called uh, Matsuko, as you can see here on the left. And uh, Matsuko has been so popular that they have made a robot clone of her or him called Matsukoroid, which you can see here on the right. And there are some very interesting videos of um, a talk show. These uh, two beings, the human and uh, and uh, their robot clone have together that uh, I recommend checking out. Um, and uh, at first glance, you might, uh, you might not be able to see that this is an actual robot sitting there. But uh, of course, when you see it starts to move, you can notice the robotic movements. Uh, 
and this line of robots called the geminoids is um, the robots that I did my master thesis on a long, long time ago. But um, it's quite fascinating to show just how far we have come when um, we are representing ourselves through technology. But in a gender sense, I find this robot super interesting because here we have uh, a male uh, dressing up in to represent in their own words, a woman. Uh, and then you are cloning a robot based on the persona this person is portraying. So you're not really cloning um, uh, the man with um, that is not wearing this, uh, what he would call a costume, uh, but you're actually cloning the female persona that this person is portraying. So you're sort of uh, losing one level of the human side of the um, duplication process here. That's quite fascinating because then we can think, is there something gendered about the robot? Is the robot now a robot uh, fe a female? Is it a robot male? Um, and that's not something that has a, a very clear answer. So just to show you that it's a bit um, uh, difficult to also set a straight line under what is a female robot, what is a male robot. And um, I also want to talk to you a little bit about artificial intelligence. So taking it down to um, a, a side that is a little bit less uh, theoretical, but also very relevant. Because technologies can discriminate. Um, and to illustrate this, I want to show you uh, a concept called garbage in, garbage out, uh, which is basically if you have um, bad data or data that doesn't make sense, uh, you can process it in many ways, but you will also get um, quite bad results when you get results from your data. And uh, through our work for the European Commission for Research, there were three main ways of um, defining a biased artificial intelligence that we looked at. Uh, number one was homogenous data sets, where you um, have, for example, a facial recognition database, but you only use white people in your data sets, leading you to not being able to recognize people of color, for example. Uh, another example is biased algorithms. Um, a famous example here is Amazon's hiring example, where Amazon was trying to hire new workers and they uh, did not um, value uh, women who applied in a high uh, score because uh, women usually in, in, in a historical manner did not work for Amazon in high numbers. So if you were a woman, you were actually devalued by the Amazon hiring algorithm. So for example, if you wrote that I uh, have played in the women's chess club, uh, it would actually give you a negative value because the word women was there. But if you just wrote chess club, it would put it higher because that showed intelligence just to show you a simple way in which uh, they can devalue uh, even quite positive things as playing chess. Uh, and then thirdly, it is the presentation and interpretation of results. So understanding what technology is doing and why it is doing that, and if it even needs to do what it is doing. And as an example of that, I want to uh, show you Microsoft's Twitter robot called Tay. Uh, Tay was a robot uh, a couple of uh, years ago in 2016 that was developed by Microsoft and released on Twitter to learn how to uh, communicate and socialize with humans. And as you can imagine, um, with the people that uh, uh, dwell on social media, uh, things turned badly quickly. So this um, this Twitter robot, it uh, quite soon uh, became a neo-Nazi. It uh, started to deny the Holocaust. It said that we should build a wall against Mexico and just reproducing all that hatred that you can find on social media. Uh, so without any boundaries, it's quite easy for technology to uh, be used in ways that we might not deem to be that um, positive. Uh, and I also wanted to go a little bit dark, uh, deeper into the facial recognition problems um, that is uh, quite uh, prevalent, because we know that large uh, technology companies uh, who are dealing with facial recognition technology, they uh, in most of the time prioritize to recognize uh, white male faces. Uh, this is an example here on the right from uh, Amazon's facial recognition algorithms, which now um, identifies uh, white uh, white skinned uh, males in 
a perfect condition. So 100% of the time, if you're a white male, you will be uh, correctly identified as that from Amazon. Uh, for darker skinned males, it's uh, also quite good, 98%. Uh, for women, it's uh, uh, less, 92%. Um, that, that is lighter skinned females. Uh, and then when you uh, put these two characteristics together, if you are a darkish skinned female, your face will probably not be recognized in that many um, cases. So only 68.6% here. Uh, and uh, there is a quite interesting movie about this now on uh, Netflix that I just wanted to recommend to you called Coded Bias, which the picture here down on the right is from. So I recommend you to check that out if you want uh, uh, an example of that. Roshan? Uh, yes? We have just uh, like uh, a small minute left. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And... Uh, also just want to mention that uh, trans people are also discriminated when it comes to facial recognition technology. For example, when you go through airport security control, if you're then um, have to go into the male or female category, you can be misgendered. Um, so I'll spend my last 30 minutes just to say that data is situated. Um, so in uh, different societies, um, different data sets and people value data in a different way. This is an example from self-driving cars where MIT um, tested who people want to save, the baby or the granny. And they found that women are more likely to be saved by anyone who wants to give their opinions and uh, pets are not as likely to be saved as humans. But uh, women tend to want to save pets more often. Uh, and also there's a quite Western Asian uh, distinction here. Uh, I'll share this with you so you can read about how to include gender and diversity in your own project research afterwards. Um, this is a publication I had that you can look at. And key takeaways to spend my last 10 seconds. Uh, anthropomorphization is closely linked to gendering. Uh, we know that technology can be gendered, biased and socially situated. Uh, but through being aware and responsible in your approach, you can mitigate this discrimination and you can also help alleviate the questions through good practices. And that was it for me. Please check out our new project, Robotics for EU, that you see here. And you can find me on social media and by email. And I look forward to discussing more with you in the roundtable. Mm -hmm.